Our Stories Vietnam is a KRWG local production honoring some of our area Vietnam veterans. These stories could not have been told without the cooperation of not only the veterans who offered to participate, but the families and local veteran groups as well. We are grateful for the support of New Mexico State University and other area organizations. KRWG's presentation of Our Stories Vietnam has been made possible in part by the visionary gift from Stan Fulton, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and viewers like you. Thank you. These are the stories of the Vietnam War as told to us by veterans. KRWG has sought to present archival footage and personal photos that approximates the location and time of their stories. However, they are not actual depictions of the situation or personal recollections. My name is Harvey Hilbert. Actually, it's Harvey Daiho Hilbert. Um, I am a Zen Buddhist priest. Uh, I'm a combat veteran. I was shot in the head May 29th, 1966 in Vietnam. Six days after my uh, 17th birthday, I enlisted in the Army. Uh, I wanted to get away. Uh, was, we were a very poor family. My mother was a high school dropout. I was a high school dropout. Um, we lived on potato soup and whatever we could rustle up. Uh, and I thought the army might be a way out of uh, poverty. Anyway, I enlisted in the, in the infantry uh, and they sent me to Germany on the other side of the world, uh, sitting in, uh, in deep snow, <laughs> training in snow and all that. I didn't have any idea what was going on in Vietnam at that time. For whatever reason, I decided to send me to Vietnam. And I'm flying in an airplane uh, with people I don't know uh, into uh, Saigon, uh, Tencent Airport. And there's a funny thing, what happens there. You arrive, and the first thing that they do is take away your money. And I'm thinking, I thought the first thing they were going to do is give me a rifle. I mean, it was a war zone after all. And as we were flying in, there were tracer rounds flying around. I knew there was some, some kind of fighting going on somewhere. Um, and I thought, well, they'll give me a rifle. And, but instead, they wanted all of our money. And then they gave us back this military payment script stuff. It was like Monopoly money. Um, and then they put us in a, in a bus to take us to a little holding area, I guess. And the bus had bars on it and screen. And I'm thinking, uh, why do we have bars and screen? This is supposed to be uh, a place that we're defending. Uh, and they're, they're we're, how do I say this? We're there for them. But it seemed like, um, at the time, it was kind of crazy. Uh, we were vulnerable to an attack right there in where we were supposed to be safe. It's strange. I was with the 3rd Brigade Task Force uh, of the 25th Infantry Division, this patch right here. Um, and I was a spec for an infantry soldier, a specialist for E4. My job was to, as the infantry says, to close with, kill or capture the enemy. Uh, and I was pretty dedicated to that. Um, I was a good shot. Um, I was a good infantry soldier, I think. Uh, it's what I wanted to do. In fact, I was on my second enlistment. So I was planning on making a career. We would go out on search and destroy missions, reconnaissance missions, things like that. The unit um, was, a, was a good unit. I, I, I valued my fellow um, combat veterans, uh, but I didn't know any of them except one who had been my paper boy in Miami uh, where I grew up. Uh, and so we kind of bonded together. My memories of Vietnam really focused on uh, the, the day I got shot. Uh, because it was, it, was, um, it was an event that changed my life forever. It was 
coming on dusk, and we went into what's called a hot landing zone. It means we were under fire. We jumped off the helicopters and took a position, and then the enemy stopped shooting. So my company commander sends out a three-person listening post to go out into the jungle and find enemy and uh, report back. Usually when that happens, they, they pick the three newest guys. And one of them was a young man that I had met. And they went about 100 meters or so out in front of the line. But the enemy hadn't gone anywhere. They were embedded in the jungle. And around midnight, they opened fire. And this three-person listening post was sitting right in the middle of this battalion of enemy soldiers. They grabbed their rifles and started running toward me. Of course, it's like one o'clock in the morning and I couldn't see who was running. All I saw were soldiers with rifles and machine gun fire coming at me. And, and so I shot at them. And, uh, and one of them fell about 10 or 15 feet from me and was screaming in pain. And it turned out it was this young man that I had met. And uh, a few minutes later, I got shot in the head and knocked my helmet off. I, I was uh, kneeling and uh, to, sh to shoot, and it hit me and it knocked me down. I, I thought somebody had thrown a rock at me. That was my first thought. It, and I reached up and felt the hole in my head. Uh, and I'm thinking, I didn't think at that time, but I, I can say this, I'm probably one of the few human beings alive that can say they've touched their own brain. Uh, it was a very scary experience. I could hardly move. And I thought that if I fell asleep, I would die. So I was trying to stay awake, listening to this young man scream. He died just before I was airlifted out. So from May, the end of May until November, I was hospitalized, one place or another. Uh, they discharged me, uh, retired me, and sent me home. Now my situation is, I'm a high school dropout. I did pass the GED, military GED, while I was in the Army. Uh, but uh, here I'm 19, partially paralyzed, and I'm on the street, in effect. Um, what do you do? One of the things I decided to do is hang out at Royal Castle restaurants and the little burger joints. And I would read. Uh, and one night a, a cop came in and um, put me up against a wall and frisked me and all that kind of stuff. Wanted to know what the hell I was doing in this restaurant at 2 o'clock in the morning. So I'm reading. Are you a vagrant? No, I'm retired. And he laughs at me. There were a lot of stories like that. When I did my study of, uh, of the combat experience that soldiers had in Vietnam, one of the things that came out was that not everything about trauma was bad. Um, there was some good. Uh, for, for example, um, it taught us what to value, what really matters. Really, what really matters. Okay. You don't know that until you're stripped of the things that you have, and now you're just you and sea rations. Uh, what do you truly value? I called it special knowledge. Combat veterans have a certain special knowledge about the way the world works that's taught to them by combat. We learn to value beauty. We can see beauty, uh, even in the worst conditions. The country of Vietnam was a beautiful country. We devastated it uh, in lots of ways, uh, but it was a beautiful country. Not everybody was evil. Uh, there were some really uh, heroic, honorable people there. And, and I think uh, our soldiers, 
were honorable in the main. If we were, if our nation was attacked directly uh, and we were in jeopardy and they needed the skills that I might have, I probably would do it again. Uh, but I might do it in a different way. I might become a, a clergy person instead of a combat soldier. Uh, the chaplaincy corps needs people to be with soldiers who are hurt, hurting. Uh, and that would be maybe the position I would take. My, my first assignment after graduation from West Point and taking airborne training and ranger training was on an air defense site in Sylvester, Georgia. I helped deactivate that site uh, when I left. Uh, that was in early 66, 13 weeks of Vietnamese, and they sent me to Vietnam. And the reason they made me a subsector advisor as opposed to a U.S. unit, there was no air defense in Vietnam. So the only other thing is fallback position to your secondary skill is an infantry. So I was an infantry advisor. When I got to Saigon, they held me there for medical pending assignment. Uh, I, was, I stayed in uh, uh, Saigon, I think about 10 days or two weeks. We worked with the Vietnamese, solving problems, helping them change things. Uh, if there were shortages of materiel or something, we could advise the chain of command and that would arrive. And we're talking regional forces, popular forces. So basically, except for our pay and our meal, well, our meals were basically Vietnamese as well. The, uh, uh, we were, actually supporting the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, uh, not so much U.S. Uh, you'd go on occasional combat patrols, get shot at. Uh, I'll just say my aim was better than the other aims. I, there were a few hits near me, but the, uh, and it was obvious to get, one of the things the Viets, Viet Cong did was shoot the radio operator and you know where the commander is or the, the important fellow is. He's somewhere in the vicinity of the radio operator. And it's easy to pick out the American because he's taller than most Vietnamese. So it was rather interesting. When I returned from Vietnam, uh, I saw a few protesters, Jane Fonda variety, I never had a direct conflict because at that time I stopped wearing my uniform off duty. Even though I still had a military haircut, still have one now. I, I basically avoided those situations where there were demos, I uh, would go around them, avoid them. Yeah, I, I yes, thinking back on all the, my military career, reserve career, tour at White Sands uh, as a civilian after I got out of the military, had a job offer I couldn't refuse out there. The, uh, uh, I would do it all over again. My name is Bob Worthington. My introduction to Vietnam actually started back in the 1950s when I was in the Marine Corps and had my first combat in the Middle East with the Marines. I left the Marines, returned to college, got commissioned through ROTC, and I had uh, applied to go to Vietnam as an advisor. Things happened, uh, I did not get there, but finally in 1965, the Army selected me to go there as an advisor. When I eventually ended up in Vietnam in early 1966, I was fluent in French, fluent in Vietnamese, and had many, many months of training.
to serve as a counter-guerrilla, counter-terrorist soldier. Well, when I got out of the plane, it was very hot, very humid. But I had been in other parts of the world where it was like that. So it was not like I was in a totally foreign area that I had no preparation for, especially being assigned in the military in uh, the uh, southeastern U.S., uh, Alabama, Georgia, places like that. It's just as hot and humid. The Air Force took us in buses that had heavy mesh wire over the windows and doors so grenades could not be thrown in. And we ended up at Copler Compound, which is where all the advisors process uh, through Vietnam to their assignments. And for me, I was assigned as the senior tactical advisor for the security of Da Nang, the largest city in, in the northern part of South Vietnam. I happened to be infantry, trained in counterinsurgency, and therefore I went over there to work as a tactical or combat advisor with Vietnamese combat troops. I would not wear a lot of rank because if you're in a combat operation with Vietnamese, most of the Vietnamese are short and darker, and the American advisors are taller, and they always have next to them a radio man. And if they've got their U.S. rank, insignia, name tag, everything else, they're very, very easy to spot by a sniper. And if you kill the advisors, you wipe out a lot of support that the Vietnamese unit could have. So I didn't wear rank or any of that. and. Uh, Part of our job was to provide security to prevent North Vietnamese or Viet Cong people, troops, supplies from crossing the border because we were on the way between the Cambodian border and Saigon. The rule was that at dark in the area around the border, nothing moves. If anything moves, it's subject to be shot. So this rule, everyone in the villages knew it, but the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese moved everything by night and hoped that they would not be interdicted by ground forces. Well, we came upon them, and that one night, this one team got more kills than the entire unit had for the previous 30 days because no one had done this before on the border. So whenever I needed help, I would call them and they would provide it immediately because they knew that uh, we had a lot of action on the border. We had, we being the Vietnamese, had secret agents in Cambodia and they would gather intelligence as to what was going on and they radioed us and told us that there was a shipment of rockets that were coming from Cambodia going to Saigon and they'd go right through us. And they told us when it would happen, like the next night. So I got the helicopters and we're flying along the border and there's a river there. The river isn't exactly on the border, but we could see tramped down vegetation where a bunch of big animals had gone into the river and where they came out on the other side and we could follow their trail through the jungle. And we went to an opening that was probably maybe, I don't know, 50 yards by 50 yards. It wasn't that big. So we sent the gunship down to inspect it. And he said, there are a bunch of water buffalo in the corner. So I knew right away what they were. They were the animals moving the rockets. So I said, kill them. So they, killed the water buffalo. And then they said, hey, this place is full of camouflaged underground bunkers. And as they flew low, they could see the opening. And so I said, okay, blow them up with your rockets. And they said, we can't do that. Because for a rocket run, you have to have enough room to get down, shoot the rockets and get up. But the field was too small. 
So I carried an M79 with me. That was one of my favorite weapons. It's a like a single barrel shotgun. It shoots a 40 millimeter grenade. Looks like a big bullet, maybe about that tall. And it's a grenade, so when it impacts, it explodes. And I had a whole bunch of grenades with me, so I said to the guy flying the uh, command and control chopper, I said, hey, take me down in front of the first bunker and I'll put a round in it, we'll see what happens. And I shoot, there's a big explosion, then a secondary explosion that just blows the thing apart. I said, hey, we got them. Go to the next one. And I don't know, third, fourth, or fifth, where the guys were in the bunker, and so we're hovering in front of them, and then they start shooting the helicopter. I've got the helmet on, and I'm wired in with the pilot. I said, are you flying through your shrapnel? He said, no, why? I've just been shot then. And so I reached under in my thigh and pulled out a piece of shrapnel like that. So I guess a bullet had probably hit a very hard metal part of the uh, uh, helicopter, got uh, twisted around, so it was a very hot piece of metal that went in and tore up the back of the leg. So we finished destroying all of the uh, bunkers and then we go back. Now on my team I have a medic. So I showed him what I had and he treated it, took care of it, fixed it up. But the bullet I guess was infected. And it went in, I don't know, that far or so, whatever. The whole thing got infected so then I had to go to the hospital and I had to operate and cut all that stuff out. I ended up with probably scar tissue like that, a big plug. And when I would sit down on with both thighs, the plug would press up into a sensory nerve and put the leg asleep. And I never told my wife what had happened. So I met her in Vietnam. She said, why are you sitting that way? And then I told her. That was uh, almost on top of 11 November, Veterans Day, 1968. All of the fighting I did was in the rural areas. I did no fighting in the cities. County fair is where the government would go in and do all kinds of things to convince the local rural people that the government is good. Now we're going into Viet Cong strongholds. So the only way to get there is to fight our way in, which we would do. And we would fight surround the village, take it over, and get all the villagers together. And we would have singers, we would have entertainers, we would give them clothes, we would give them food, we would give them comic books with no writing but uh, pictures so they could see how good the government was. We'd check the IDs and we'd end up with a lot of VCS, Viet Cong suspects because we either knew who they were through intelligence or they did not have the proper identification. So we would do this. We would bring in medical teams, Vietnamese, and in this case, we had a Navy corpsman. We would inoculate the kids. The singing was over, the entertainment was over, we'd given away clothes and all that, it was night, and we were attacked, so we were fighting. <clears throat> And I'm in the uh, little hut that the battalion commander had taken over for his headquarters. And this old man had come in to see the American advisor and the battalion commander. And his story was that a little girl had been shot up pretty badly. Could the Americans medevac her out, save her life? And then I'm talking to the battalion commander, do you believe him? And, and I thought he sounded uh, honest. What he was telling him was the truth. So I asked the Marine radio guy to contact a Marine unit that had helicopters and would one be willing to come in, take the girl out. It was a miserable night, it was rainy, 
the uh, cloud cover was low and everything. And we explained the situation. They wanted to know if it would be safe to land. And I said, I have no idea. Uh, we'll see what we could do. We said, bring the mother, bring the baby. And how are we going to get the helicopter in if we're fighting? So the mother came carrying the baby in a little basket. And uh, the Viet Cong said they would stop the war, quit fighting if we would uh, save the baby. So I got my corpsman, check her out. Her feet were all shot up. She was probably a year old or so, maybe less. And the, I told the Marines what we would do. And the Viet Cong said when they heard the helicopter, they'd quit. So the helicopter, the Marines said they'd come in, so they came in, and I went out in the middle of a field, and now I'm in the middle of where the fighting's going on. And uh, we had uh, a couple of Vietnamese NCOs, we had the mother, we had the baby in the basket. The helicopter, you could hear it, the shooting stops, I get out. Uh, and I'm talking on the radio to the helicopter and guiding them in. And they come in, they sit down. We put the mother on the helicopter, put the uh, baby in the uh, basket, and the helicopter takes off. And I get out of there in a hurry. 20 or 30 minutes uh, later, the war begins again. That was my job, and I wanted to document it. So I, I had a rabbit's foot, I had a St. Christopher's medal, and I told my wife that I would be very careful, and I was, I think, highly, superbly trained in what I did. But I was very, very lucky. I was a professional soldier. I was trained in the infantry, combat special operations. Uh, let's turn it around. You've got someone that's going to be a career firefighter, work for the fire department. Do they want to spend their entire career never ever going to a fire? No. They train to do things. I was trained to do things. I was good at it. I went there because that's what I wanted to do. And I was not drafted. I was not forced to go there. Uh, and therefore, uh, certainly I would do it again in spite of what has occurred afterwards. That's, that's me. My name is Leonard Ramirez, and I was with the uh, United States Marine Corps. I had seven brothers that were older than me. And most of them have, had already been in the military. And I remember I looked up to them and they had a brochure of the Marine Corps. And they showed it to me and they says, you know, these guys right here, these are the Marines, they're the best. Of course, I believed them. I was in Mayfield High and I remember there was a lot of news about what was going on in Vietnam. I remember thinking, well, Maybe I shouldn't go in the Marine Corps, but there's a lot of Americans getting killed and it's really getting bad. And I thought, no, you know, when it's my time to die, I'm going to die. So I've always wanted to be a Marine, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it. So I did it. The day that I graduate from high school, I'm going to join the Marine Corps because I want to be a Marine. I did all the testing and I signed up in April of 67. I remember people tell me about the Marine Corps boot camp telling me that's that's rough it's gonna be a tough thing to do and I'm thinking to myself you know I can I can take tough you know I could run I could march I could you know do all that stuff but once I got to San Diego it was a whole different story it was just more than tough I mean nobody warned me that they were gonna to be tough on your on your head they were just yelling at you and just on you after the first day, I was like, what did I get myself into? But I thought, I, you can't get out. You got yourself in a mess, now you have to finish it. So I just kept going. 
but it was, a, it was pretty tough, uh, mentally as well as physically. I remember when we were arriving in Vietnam and uh, we were just coming down to the airport in Da Nang and I looked out in that country and it just did not look very pretty. For some reason or other, it just looked real drabby, it just didn't look good to me. And uh, we landed and uh, the minute I stepped off that, uh, that airplane, uh, it just felt so humid and just so uh, wet and, and even a certain smell to it. I wasn't there very long, maybe a week. So they told us we we're moving to an area called Fulak. So we loaded up the trucks and we left and we went over the Haivan Pass. It was north of Da Nang. There was a lot of jungle. There was uh, just jungle mountains all around that area that we were gonna build a base at. Of course, being from Las Cruces, I had not seen very much jungle before, but I saw a lot of jungle there. Uh, there was not a base, there was no base there. We were gonna build a base up. So we had a perimeter set up with the trucks and everything and uh, we got some new guys there in Fulak and there was this guy that I met there, Mexican-American, Chicano guy like me and I said, hey, well, you know what's your name and stuff and he told me his name and I asked him, where are you from? He goes, well, I'm from El Paso. And I tell him, well, I'm from Las Cruces. And you know, El Paso, Las Cruces are that close together so we were good friends the rest of the time we were there uh, you know, and uh, to this day we still stay in touch. We had our own tent and we used to hang around and talk and, uh, and then go to sleep, get up early the next morning, go to that and help the cooks out and stuff like that. And then I remember just laying in that cot and then some uh, Marine walked out and he came in and he says, hey, we're getting hit. So boy, I tell you, in less than two seconds, I had my boots on, my flag jacket, my helmet, and just ran out that door. We had been working on a, on a trench right next to that tent earlier that day. And I jumped into that trench. The minute I jumped to it, into it, I just felt a bunch of uh, uh, debris hit me, sand and rocks and stuff like that. It just hit me and I, I got into the, that hole and the two guys behind me, they fell on top of me. And I was kind of trying to push them off and those motors were coming in. Man, they were just coming in. That was my first taste of warfare. I go, those, they're trying to kill me. And I could hear the motors coming in. You can hear them coming in. And they're getting closer and closer and they walk them. Uh, when I say they walk them, is they keep going down the base. They stop and come back this way. And there's motors just coming in. Because we didn't have that trench. We didn't have it covered. I said, one of those motors is going to come in. It's going to just land on top of me. And I could hear them coming in. And I said, when is this going to stop? And uh, it was my first taste and it was scary. And then I pushed those guys off and uh, when it stopped for a while, they were dead. The two guys that were standing behind me got killed. And one of those guys, I remember both of them. I can't remember their names, but I remember talking to them. One of those guys, we were together earlier that day building that trench and he had taken off his shirt and he was, we were just filling in, digging, filling in sandbags, making that trench. And then we stopped for a little while and I looked at him and he was just kind of like messing around, kind of like he was posing with muscles and stuff like that. And I just laughed at him. He goes, hey, do you have a girlfriend? I says, no. He goes, I got a girlfriend. He took out his wallet and showed me a picture of his girlfriend. He says, when I get back from Vietnam, I'm gonna marry her. That guy got killed that night. And him and the other guy was in there, was making uh, uh, like a little recording, he had a little tape recording. He was making a recording for his mom and he got killed that night. Those were the two guys that got killed in that attack, the two guys that were standing right behind me. When you're ordered to do something, you do it without asking questions, without, you know, hesitating. That had a lot to do with getting me through that war. I remember being yelled at, says, you gotta move, and I didn't wanna move, but I did it, and, and that's what saved me. After that motor attack, I got back with my third platoon, Alpha Company, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, and we go out and work patrols. So much happened that month. We were out every night and we'd go out on ambushes. We'd get hit on the way to our ambushes. I saw Marines getting killed for the first time. There was a guy there and he was like a tough guy, you know, just tough. And he had kind of an accent. And he used to tell me he was Portuguese, Puerto Rican, born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii. And I remember him. His name was Enos. 
the mud was coming up to our thighs in our waist sometimes. Enos was the first guy who was a point man, and I was right behind him. It was getting close to, to the end of the day, and so we went back toward the village so we could set up. Stopped and looked up at him to see which way he was going, because I was tired of getting into the mud. And just when I did that, there was a loud explosion, and I just saw him go down. I didn't really know what a booby trap was. In my mind, I thought it was a motor round. I said, he, they hit him with a direct hit with a motor round. How can they do that? I didn't think they were that accurate. And the Navy corpsman's walking by me, and he yells at me. He says, get up, get up. He stepped on a booby trap. So I got up and went over there, and there was, and he was drowning, and I put my hand underneath his head, and I picked him up. And he was, that guy was tore apart. He was torn up, his legs, his arms. The Navy corpsman was just exceptional. They, they could do stuff, you know, just, just put this guy back together, talking to him at the same time, and I'm like, man, he was right in front of me. We finally did what we could, and the medevac came down, we put him on there, and then they tell me, uh, Ramirez, you got point. So now I was the first guy. We went in and uh, you know, made it to the village that night. I don't know if he lived or died, I don't know. Well, that kind of started out the last few months in high school. Counselors got all the, the senior boys together. He read off the names of uh, a bunch of guys and asked them to stand. And then he said, these here guys have got 3.0 or better grade point average. And uh, they can get college scholarships and they can go on to college. The rest of you are cannon fodder for counselors to say something like that to uh, young men about what they're uh, gonna be faced with and that they have no choice, that's totally wrong. And that then I said, well, that ain't gonna happen to me. And then it came time after Labor Day to start uh, college in uh, Boulder, Colorado and get my uh, student exemption. And that lasted for two weeks, and I decided I had enough of going to school. Dropped out in time to get uh, part of my tuition back and sell my books back. The draft board, within a week's time, had changed my uh, student deferment to 1A. The next Monday, I went to the Air Force recruiter in Boulder, Colorado, and begged you got to get me in the Air Force. I can't do no Army, and I sure can't do no Marine Corps. <laughs> and so he says, well, let me check your aptitude scores. And they were good enough for me to be a security policeman, a cook, roads and grounds, or an aircraft mechanic. And uh, I was to return in December to go in the Air Force. So I was, <laughs> made it. When we got to uh, Cameron Bay, uh, it was April Fool's Day, 1970. And when they opened the uh, door of the aircraft, we were dressed in uh, winter clothes because it was still winter in the States. And when that door opened and all that heat came in and you were wearing uh, dress blue wool uniform, <laughs> It just, uh, that you just wanted to get off of that airplane and get some relief from the, the heat, the humidity. It was 90 to 100 degrees and the humidity was 100%. You could uh, wave your arm and the sweat would just drip right off. I was assigned to Tuiwa Air Base, which is about uh, oh, 100 miles north of Cameron Bay, right on the South China Sea. Me and about five other guys got there, and it was on a Friday, have fun, clubs over there, and uh, go swimming in the South China Sea, and report here on Monday. And so uh, we did that, and of course everybody over there had a, had a tan. Well, we come and we're white. <laughs> and they could tell 
that we're new people. So uh, we went out uh, that, uh, that weekend and got severely burned, having to wear starched uh, uniforms on Monday. Uh, man, that, that took a while to get over with, and especially with all the humidity. But when we uh, processed in on that Monday, that uh, they didn't need us there for aircraft mechanics. We would be uh, held up for 30 days they had a detail for us to do. You know you're not gonna like it. At that time in 1970, they had already determined Agent Orange and the uh, Malathion spraying of uh, South Vietnam was hazardous to the health of the GIs. And so they were in the process of taking all the drums of that herbicide and uh, mosquito spray and the Navy had incinerator ships out there that were destroying the chemicals. The, the barrels were leaking, and so, and, but they told us, don't worry about it, it's harmless as water. That's one of the gifts from Vietnam that I still have to deal with on a daily basis. Me and two other guys got sent to camp, back to Cameron, and uh, worked there in the transit aircraft maintenance. We would lead them to park and uh, service them with gas and then uh, worked on different types of aircraft. And uh, that was one blessing that I got was I learned uh, uh, good mechanic skills from the Air Force in my time as a aircraft mechanic. People probably don't know, uh, for every infantry man in the field, there's nine other people that support that one man. My family has, uh, has, has always been in aviation. And when I got that flying position uh, with the C-47s, a couple times a month, construction equipment tires, we would load them up and fly them to Singapore and Hong Kong to be recapped. And so once we uh, get up in a C-47, it's about six hours to Hong Kong. And during that time en route, I would get to fly the C-47 all by myself. And for a 20-year-old kid, that was the best thing that I have ever experienced in my life, is being able to fly such a wonderful airplane. And these airplanes had 10,000 some hours on them at that point. And you could see where the, the bullet holes had been uh, patched. I'd like to have one, but my wife won't let me. But. A week before I was to leave, uh, a uh, master sergeant had me come to his office and he asked me if I wanted to extend another six months, and they would give me an additional seven-day R&R and a 30-day leave anywhere in the free world, and they would pay the airfare. So I said, well, sir, that's some real good incentives and all that, but if you're dead, that doesn't do you a whole lot of good. I did not take him up on that offer, and I left on April Fool's Day, 1971. And I haven't uh, had any uh, urge to go back. Yeah, when we heard the landing gear of the Freedom Bird uh, lock into place as we were airborne, that was uh, a lot of cheering going on. We did a refueling stop at uh, McCord, uh, he got off the airplane and a lot of people just bent down and kissed the ground. I've uh, really, really been blessed uh, with my military career of uh, 24 years and 22 days. Yes, I would. Everybody just wanted to live and go home. And that's what uh, 
uh, everybody goal was every day. It's, uh, uh, it was a very humbling experience. This is uh, a good thing that uh, uh, New Mexico State University is doing, and I want to thank you. You know, freedom is not free, but somebody's got to pay for it. Through a lot of adversities, uh, God will always give you a way out. My name is Armando Young Amador, and I, I was born in Hurley, New Mexico, and I've lived uh, in Bayard. After I was two years old, we moved to Bayard. I lived there all my life. Uh, my intention was to really become a Marine. I was 17 years old, so that put a little delay on me moving forward, but my mom said no until I got drafted, and I went to the Army. The lottery came into effect, and my number was called, so I was drafted. Then uh, I went through my training, at Fort Ord, California. And from there we came home, took a little bit of a break, and then we left to Vietnam, and I got to Vietnam on August 23rd, 1972. We ended up in uh, Cameron Bay, and we were instructed, while we were in the plane, we were instructed to get up, get in the aisle, walk slowly, but you make sure you make it to your destination. As they opened the doors, the heat was bad. We weren't used to that hot weather out there, you know, humidity sky high, you know. But anyway, so then the smell, you know, we have to get used to something like that. But those were the three factors, you know, the heat, the humidity, and the smell. So on the next day, we go to our second day of orientation, you know. Uh, we come back, the guys looked at us like, hey, you guys relax. Uh, no, we're in Vietnam. No, relax, there's nothing happening here. But that night, Camera Bay got hit, and we had to run anywhere we could find a place of safety. We didn't know Camera Bay that well. Then the following morning, by the time we woke up, now where's our bunker? We didn't know how far we had run or where we were at. This is the last time I take my boots off. And that was a promise I made to myself, because if I have to kick ass, I got my boots on. We were flown to Tuiwa because that was going to be where our unit was going to be set at. Maybe 300 yards away from where we landed, there was a compound, you know, and, and as soon as we got off, the helicopters left, we heard something, a bang out there, you know. And we were scared, what do we do? So we just said, you know what, let's just wait. So we stayed there for about an hour just waiting and waiting, so things were calm and everything. So we finally just single file, we went up to where we were going, you know, and uh, we were looking for the the captain's office. That office was full of people because apparently they had thrown a grenade into the captain's office and blown him away. So we go back to the bunker that we went into first and I asked the guy, I said, what's going on here? I said, what happened? Oh, don't worry about it. It's a gang, it's a, it's a drug issue. To them, it was the norm. To us, well, to me, something totally different. It just so happened that we went to Tuiwa, we went to Gopul Guard, we went to on the rice paddies, talking about miles and miles of rice paddy. Myself and Dave Urunda, the guy that went to school with me, you know, we went out there, we were out there going on patrol, you know, and we saw a little kid out there and uh, I said, hey, look at that kid, man. What's he doing here? There's nobody. Where's his mom and dad? There's nobody here. So we decided we'd go, you know, through the rice paddies, trying to reach that little kid. Sergeant Yellow said, you don't leave this place, get back here. I said, why, well, there's that little kid. He said, no, you leave him alone. We walked about maybe a quarter of a mile. So we could still see the kid way back there. And <laughs> it was gone. What's next? What do you have to expect? Where's the Viet Cong? Do we see them? Well, when you see a whole bunch of people out there in the rice paddies, which one is a Viet Cong? They all look the same. Can you just fire your weapon because you want to? No. Our instructions were, you do not fire until you see the white of their eyes. So you try and fulfill that obligation of saying, okay, until I see the white of their eyes, maybe they'll be too cold, but maybe not, you know, so I don't know. I got shot at, not hit, but shot at. And uh, my buddy, David, was the one that just pushed me to the side. What are you doing? I'm trying to kill you right now. Because when we went to the end of the rice paddies, there were some trees there. So I got the machine gun, man, and I just started firing. A few minutes later, you hear, I got one, but I was scared like shit. But I told myself, it's
It's either him or me, and he shot at me first. He deserved to die. Two days of combat, and during those two days, we were just fighting to protect ourselves. In the jungle, you can't see the fighters. Live one moment at a time now. It's not live for today or tomorrow. No, one moment at a time. I tried to pray the Our Father, and that's the word. I, can't, I couldn't pray the Our Father. I was lost. Mentally, it was affecting me. Yes, I was a squad leader. I was trying to help everybody else, but these guys were doing drugs. We were not taught to accept death. We were taught to fight for our freedom. I didn't say anything about death. I had one of the guys that was with me in my, my squad and all that. I used to call him Lucky. He looked like the guy from Lucky Charms, you know, cereal box and all that. He and I got very close and we joked and whatnot and all that. So one day they sent us out on a, on a little mission. So we go out there and all that. We got ambushed. They kicked our butts. And poor Lucky, I mean, he got hit. And I went back to where he was at. I held him in my arms because he was still alive. And he was bleeding. I could feel the warmth of his blood just go down my hands. And I told him, Lucky, you're okay. I said, I'm doing the best I can. I'm gonna pray for you, Lucky. And he died in my arms. And then the sergeant comes and he tells me, I'm gonna put him down. We gotta go. I said, I can't leave him here. He said, leave him. We gotta go. So I set him down, put his helmet next to him, and I let him go. So it became very hard for me to try and get through this whole thing. But I said, well, my mentality is gonna to have to change. You become an animal to survive. Because as a human, you won't make it. Unless you go on drugs or you do whatever you want to, to calm your nerves. Now I understand exactly why those guys did what they did. They had a purpose. But the purpose was unknown to the American people here. So after two days of combat, you know, we were gonna to go to a fire base. And as we were walking towards the fire base, and there was a platoon coming out, so as they got closer and we were going in, they were coming out. As I got closer, you know, I said, Angel! He wouldn't turn around. I'll call him by his nickname, because who else will know his nickname? So I call him Anki. And he turns around and he says, Mondo, is that you? I said, yeah, Angel, man, I need to talk to somebody. I said, because I've had a bad time, bad experiences, you know. He said, give me some beer. I said, we'll have a beer. I said, no, I don't drink. He said, but no, but I do. I said, okay, fine. I'll go and get you some beer. So we went into the fire base and they went out. And I was so at ease because I found somebody. Somebody I was going to be able to talk to. And not even 15 minutes later, my captain comes and says, you guys get ready. So you guys are going back out there. That platoon went out there, they got hammered. So get ready, so we go back out there. Well, they got ambushed and Angel got shot. It just totally bothered me. I got to put him in a body bag. When I got back, I never told his family. I kept that to myself and it bothered me. I live like an animal. I believe like an animal. They're not taking me anywhere. I'm taking them. You know, then all of a sudden they become trophies. Whoever kills is a trophy. Not anymore a, a, a body, it's something that lives. No, it's a trophy for us. So how many trophies do you want before you get home? See, the mentality changes. Now you're playing a game. There comes this helicopter. Sergeant get off, gets off that helicopter. And he tells us, well, he's out there. I need to find Amador. He's going home. Are you Amador? Don't screw around with me, man. I'll shoot you right here, man. Talk to you. Wanna fool around with me? I'll shoot you right now. I said, no, no, here's your orders. He showed me my orders. I didn't turn back because I didn't know anybody. All I did was walk forward. So what happened to my buddies, I have no idea. All I know is that I went to go process out of Vietnam. I thought it was only gonna be just me, Armando, you don't know. About 500 guys out there, man, just waiting to start processing. We were in line. So they took us to the airport. What happens? Delay. You will go pull guard. What? No weapons? No nothing? So we go out there, we gotta pull guard now. That's how much stupidity we even faced. So sometimes you wonder, was it really worth it coming down here and all that? We were instructed, you walk to that plane. We didn't walk to that plane. We shoved ourselves inside that plane. We wanna make sure we got on it. Once we got on the plane, total silence. You're going to heaven. We get to Tacoma. Everybody was yelling at us, you baby killer, you, all that crap you gotta put up with, you know. If we were in America, I think that we would have had at least a smile in us to say we are home. There's not one smile. 
Not one smile, no one cracked a joke, nothing. Because we were pissed off. That I was killing people. And one of the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt not kill. But because you're, you're under the government order, you must do as you were ordered. But not because you want to do it from the heart. And that bothers everybody. That bothers me a hell of a lot, you know. When I got home, I talked to five priests. I asked them, where do I stand with God? It's because I violated one of the Ten Commandments. Not because I wanted to, but because that's the way it was. They said, you are forgiven because this is war. And when there's a war, God knows. So the reality of it is, we fought for a country that didn't believe in us. If the time came, and if I was as young as I was back then, mentally I can be young, but my body's telling me no. I would do it mentally, yes. Physically, I can't. But mentally, yes.